with the, um, sorry, just excuse me. Um, I grew up in, in the classic sort of patchwork quilt um, landscape, uh, which was very indicative of Ireland at that time. Uh, we had, you know, we, we, each, each, each field had a name and uh, still remember those but like when I go back there now and I saw with the dairy expansion particularly and tillage as well in the late 70s early 80s um, the removal of, of the hedgerows was um, it was in full swing and um, didn't debate for quite some time and as a young as a young person that was uh, I suppose it was almost like a trauma without overstating it and it was a kind of a, a wake up to me uh, I had a deep connection with the land uh, still do um, and when I look back now, I kind of look back at that as a very as a difficult time when it was that was our playground. And I suppose we, in recent years, again with the um, with the milk quota issues and the expansion of dairy, and not just dairy, uh, you know, and and other other um, actors as well. That the the hedgerows are are you know I know that Tony's group hedgerows Ireland. You were uh, an NGO if I if I'm correct, formed in 2019 to address issues in Tipperary around Irish rail and the removal of hedgerows there. So you might you might just uh, talk to that. So look, to, uh, Alan, I'll, I'll leave you talk away there. You've, I think it's about 15 minutes, uh, 15, 20 minutes of a presentation. So I said, just to repeat, if any, we can do a Q&A for about 20, 25 minutes afterwards. Finish time, we're gonna finish at about five to eight. Um, and if, if anyone wants to put questions or comments into the chat or make a, or a question or comment at the end as well, we'd be more than happy to hear what you have to say. So, um, Alan, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. And also thanks to uh, Louis as well from Just Transition Greens for setting this up and facilitating this tonight because um, I'm a technophobe. So, um, Louis, uh, thanks for that. So, thanks, Alan. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, John, so much. Um, and I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to talk hedgerows with you for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, as you said, I'm from Hedgerows Ireland, a national body, but we're Tipperary based. I'm speaking from near Featherton, Tipperary this evening. I guess that I don't have to convince too many of you that hedgerows are important. And one of the heartening things about the, the work that we do in our group is that we find that everybody or nearly everybody likes hedgerows. But what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to talk about why they're probably even more important than you may have realized. Then I'll maybe surprise you by listing the very wide range of groups and bodies who support our efforts to protect and promote them, which includes some perhaps uh, less expected bedfellows. Then I'm gonna show you a little about the grim reality of the bad stuff that's going on. But then I'm going to finish with an update on what we and other groups are trying to achieve and make things better. And there is some good news to report. One thing I'd like to say at the beginning is that hedges are not just in the countryside around fields. We also have urban hedgerows in towns and villages equally important in their own way. They have a very special role to play. So, we have approximately 680,000 kilometers of hedgerows left, covering about 6% of the country, which sounds like a lot, but the not so good news is that only about a third or less are in good condition. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of hedgerow removal taking place. And I'll talk more a little bit about those problems in the bad news section. Some context here. In Ireland, we have only 11% of forest cover, maybe a bit more, it's supposed to be increasing at the moment, but that still compares very badly to a European average of 33%. And we have very little native woodland uh, of that percentage, about 2%, the remainder is non-native conifers. So, and they're no use for biodiversity. That means that our hedgerows are relatively even more important than in other countries for the wide range of reasons, which I'll come to next. So what do hedgerows do? Well, it's an incredible list, as you can see, and it does depend so much, as I will stress, on the quality of the hedgerows. But it does raise the exciting prospect that if, it, if we could get our hedgerows right, 
we would address so many of our current challenges. For example, biodiversity. Two thirds of our native birds nest or feed or both in hedges. Over a hundred of our native plants live in or beside hedgerows. And a really important point, field margins and ditches are a vital part of what makes up a good, healthy, productive hedgerow. And by the way, way the, the word productive is important because the Department of Agriculture still uses the very unfortunate phrase non-productive when it refers to landscape features such as hedges and ponds and, and ditches, whereas clearly hedgerows are extremely productive for the reasons that I'm enumerating. Carbon storage is a really hot topic and hedges are a massive um, source of carbon storage and sequestration, but only if they are in good gen. And, and that means that they need to be big and annual cutting is a problem. Uh, Chogusk reported a study in February of this year that showed that if hedges are cut severely and annually, they are actually a source of net carbon emissions, which is a, a very profound and important finding. And when I come to management in a little bit, I'll say more about how things might be done differently. Soil protection, flood control. Well, flood control is so important as well. Hedgerows act as sponges. They retain water um, at times of flood and in increasingly common extreme weather events, they prevent a uh, huge runoff of water from the land. But at times of drought, they retain water and release it more slowly. In terms of soil protection, they stop nutrient loss and pollutant loss um, and the loss of soil into waterways and the protect from siltation and damage to waterways as a result. Shelter and shade are so important. Uh, the effect of shelter on livestock, it's a, an animal rights issue. Um, at in times of cold, wet weather, um, animals need somewhere to shelter. But less understood is the impact of very hot weather on livestock. I was talking to a, a farmer, Donald Sheehan, who is in charge of the Bride Project in Cork recently about the impacts of extreme hot weather events on dairy cattle. And he told me that at temperatures of above 20 degrees centigrade, um, dairy cows production of milk decreases, the protein content decreases, and animals become stressed and unhappy. And again, the effect of hedgerows is hugely protective here. Pest control is a less well understood benefit from hedgerows. We visited with the Farmer's Journal, the farm of uh, Tom Butler in Bennett's Bridge earlier this year. Uh, Tom is not an organic farmer, but he told us that the effect of insects living in his enormous hedges, such as hoverflies, uh, wasps, uh, ladybirds, have a clear impact in reducing aphid infestation. And this is just yet another benefit of hedgerows, in this case, on tillage. Now, of course, from the point of view of landscape, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, John, hedgerows define through a mosaic, a patchwork quilt of, of uh, connecting corridors. They define our landscape. They, they make it what it is, and they are, they are beautiful and they are one of the reasons that people uh, visit our country and, and love it. And uh, many hedgerows are ancient historic townland boundaries. Um, the bare denuded look after the removal of hedgerows is a source of real distress to people, and we get so many emails from people about this. They're very much part of our green image. This uh, picture of a, a beautiful country lane bounded by hedgerows uh, tells its own story. It's, it, it's a wonderful sight in spring. You can see bluebells on the right and um, cow parsley. Uh, you can also see an ash tree, which reminds us of the effect of ash dieback 
on hedgerows at the moment. Uh, ash is such a common tree species in our woodlands and hedgerows, and its loss is already having a devastating effect. But it reminds us of the need to renew hedgerows and to look after what we've got left. Another issue that comes up in this slide is that of road safety, which I'll come to later, um, and, and the often heavy-handed and overreactive um, response to lines of visibility. This is a yellow hammer, a beautiful uh, bird that is common in the southeast of the country, typically in tillage areas. It's red listed, it's under threat, it needs dense hedges, it tends to nest at the lower parts of really good quality hedges, but it's very much under threat at the moment. One of the many mammals that enjoys hedgerows is the hedgehog. Um, the gardener's friend loves slugs, but again, it's under threat. There's been a 50% reduction in the last 20 years, and it's you know, such an important and lovely mammal. I referred briefly to pest control in, the, uh, in, in an earlier slide. Uh, the barn owl is a great rat catcher, and it needs hedgerows to hunt along and it's also a red listed bird. There's some good news about returning numbers in some parts of the country, but owls and barn owls in particular need hedgerows. And we have um, over 100 bee species, 77 solitary, 21 bumblebees, and of course the, the honeybee. But a third of our bee species are under threat of extinction. Hedges provide the essential needs for pollinators. They provide pollen and nectar, places to breed, places to overwinter, corridors to travel along, and food from spring to autumn. They're five-star pollinators, and they're needed for crops, including apples, strawberries, other fruit, vegetables, and of course, wildflowers. A plug here for our wonderful National Biodiversity Centre in Waterford, uh, a, a fantastic resource, but I'm particularly referring to a study under the Biodiversity Centre going on in Kildare, which is looking at 40 farms in Kildare and assessing the impact of uh, various measures to improve uh, the outlook for pollinators. And already they're finding that large bushy hedges that are managed less intensively and cut less frequently can have up to a tenfold increase in pollinators. Hazelnuts, a wonderful sight and a wonderful snack. Here's my neighbor, Sergi, having a mid morning snack of hazelnuts a few weeks ago uh, nearby. But who actually cares about hedgerows? I mentioned earlier that there is a, a longer list than you might expect. Most farmers really care about their hedgerows and we've been really heartened and pleased by the support we've received and continue to and increasingly receive from farmers. Farming groups are, and organizations are a little more shy about uh, nailing their colors to the mast, but there is massive support for good hedgerows on most farmers. Obviously, environmentalists, uh, bird watchers and, uh, and, and the like. Fishermen recognize the importance of good hedgerows in protecting waterways. Hunters, maybe less uh, expected, but people who shoot um, know that hedgerows provide habitat and cover, and they are very much on board with us about the need to protect and to rejuvenate and increase good quality hedgerows. Beekeepers, uh, of course, are really enthused about the value of hedgerows. Townies and tourists. We wrote a letter to the Irish Times this year about all the, the issues around hedgerows, the need for better payments and better protection and better incentivization. And this slide is simply to show the range of groups of people who signed that letter with no hesitation. And, and the, the obvious uh, uh, suspects like um, Tashka and uh, Elaine McGough and Cybo Neal, 
but some perhaps less expected um, people signed up very readily, including, as I mentioned, the hunters, the, the fox hunters, as well as the shooters and, and fishermen. So hedgerows really have a huge support base. But what is the problem? Here we have the Limerick to uh, Limerick Junction to Waterford railway line a few years ago, uh, with a wonderful habitat on each side of the rail, because uh, as we know, railway corridors uh, are a fantastic um, habitat. But what's the problem? Well, here's the same stretch of railway after Irish rail contractors went in to replace the fencing. And instead of putting new fencing up, which was indeed needed to keep fields and the, the rail line stock proof, uh, for economic reasons, uh, they elected to grub out the entire hedgerow along many kilometers of this line, uh, leaving the, the really awful site you see in this slide. Hedgerow removal elsewhere is a big issue for us, not just in Tipperary where we're based, but we get reports from all around the country of an increasing phenomenon. Uh, very often, uh, we are seeing the impact of large corporate investment style landowners and syndicates who are not deterred by the existing regulations or fines around hedgerow removal, which are themselves very ineffective and poorly applied buying up large tracts of land for investment purposes, often for massive tillage prairie type fields, totally out of step with all thinking and research currently. And this has a knock on effect on other areas such as land prices, the unaffordability of land for young farmers. This is an area our group is very interested in, the, the whole issue of land acquisition. And I might, if this time later, come back to that, uh, point. And I mentioned hedgerow management. This is Irish Rail again. Um, I mean, to, to call that management would be uh, doing a disservice to the word. But the issue of roadside hedge flailing is a source of great concern to us and indeed to many members of the public. The, uh, the lack of training and certification for hedgerow contractors the often hysterical overreaction to issues of road safety can lead to really ugly and inappropriate hedge cutting of this kind. And this approach is often driven by intimidatory letters from local authorities uh, who advise landowners that they are culpable uh, in the event of any accident on the road uh, without giving and putting the onus on landowners to cut or remove trees and hedges in a way that is entirely uh, inappropriate to the situation. So all this stuff going on in Tipperary back a few years ago led to the formation of our group and we initially uh, were a campaigning group on the issue of Irish rails, hedgerow removal. Here we are at Limerick Junction um, staging a protest but we continued our work as we learned more about the, uh, the wider issues of the threats to hedgerows. And we took a protest to the uh, gates of Dáil Éireann earlier this year. And, and let's all hope this kind of protest can continue to take place despite recent events outside the door. We attracted a large and lively crowd and delivered a letter to the minister with various demands around the issues I've touched on. And I'm pleased to say that Minister McConnellogue came down from his ivory tower and met with us and listened to our concerns. Um, and we will hope for better things going forward. Our group really focuses on three main areas, education, payments for hedgerows and protection. And we're really happiest in the first area. Education is our core um, subject. Here we are at the Clonmel Agricultural Show, um, talking to young farmers and, and others, handing out pamphlets and leaflets from Birdwatch Ireland, um, Bad Conservation from the National Biodiversity Centre, and 
engaging and listening to feedback about all the issues around hedgerows. <clears throat> this is us at the North Tipperary <clears throat> Agricultural Show. Again, uh, getting a lot of feedback and spreading the word. In terms of education, I mentioned that um, hedgerow management is really important. And one of the messages we've been pushing this year with the support of the National Parks and Wildlife Service and Chagask is the simple idea that bigger are better. In other words, if hedges are allowed to achieve uh, height and width and density, they are better at storing carbon, there's far more biodiversity and better shelter and shade, soil protection, flood and drought mitigation. And there is at the moment a very positive um, collaboration between Chagask and the Heritage Council, who have been bringing together stakeholders during the summer to try to get new guidelines for hedgerow management, which we will hopefully lead to a, a better management style um, in, in, uh, in going forward. Payments. It's so important that uh, good hedgerows are properly incentivized and funded. The new cap which came into uh, being uh, in January is quite good on planting new hedgerows and it has to be commended for that, but it unfortunately completely missed the opportunity to reward existing hedgerows for good quality. And, and that was a missed opportunity and one we hope that will be remedied in the next cap. The issue of hedgerow protection is, and many of you will be aware of this, the uh, regulations and the rules around this are disconnected. <clears throat> they include the Wildlife Act, uh, which only operates during the nesting season and is therefore ineffective outside of that time. It's difficult to apply. There are many exemptions to it. And it's operated by the National Parks and Wildlife Service, who are still under-resourced and uh, the lack of rangers is a real problem. The environmental impact assessment regulations are currently uh, the other or protective regulation in place, but they also are very ineffective and are poorly applied and need revision. And in fact, there is a review of them going on at the moment, and we hope that they will result in a, a much more uh, sensible set, a set of reg regulations. <clears throat> Conditionality, uh, that word refers to the the paying of the basic farm payments to landowners to keep their land in good condition. And this has some protective effect in terms of hedgerows in that if a landowner wishes to remove a hedgerow, um, they must pre-plant uh, double the amount of hedgerow that they intend to take out ahead of removal. Uh, and this is fine so far as it goes, but again, it's poorly overseen uh, and regulated. And the biggest problem with it is that a new hedge will take perhaps a generation to leave the benefits of the hedge it replaces. <clears throat> Typically new hedges are mono species, very often hawthorn, not necessarily native, uh, and often don't have a ditch alongside it, which the old hedge did. <clears throat> so for all those reasons, replacing old with new is simply not a, a, a good situation. So what can you do if you're concerned, particularly in the issue that I've just mentioned in terms of removal and, um, and hedgerow destruction? There's a popular view that there's very little that can be done. And, and many people who contact us uh, feel that they have you know, tried to get help and not received it. But in fact, uh, in terms of hedgerow removal, the uh, EIA screening service in the Department of Agriculture in Wexford is very responsive to issues where excessive hedgerow removal is taking place. And, and we have been very encouraged by their response to complaints that have been made about this. 
And the NPWS, as I say, during the nesting season is the first port of call. And uh, again, with new rangers being appointed, we hope that that will improve in terms of, uh, of the service that they provide. <coughs> Of course, on a more positive note, what you can do is to plant a hedgerow. And there's excellent advice on the Chagas website and on the ukhedgelink.org.uk website uh, with advice about planting uh, new hedgerows and stressing the need to uh, keep plants native and to plant a wide variety of different uh, species hawthorn, hazel, holly, spindle, blackthorn, and so on. And of course, we would hope that you will check out our website for more information and updates on the work that we're doing. We have a social media presence on Instagram. We have a Facebook Save Our Hedgerows page. And we have a mailing list. And we're always looking for more support for the work that we're doing. Before finishing off, I just want to illustrate examples of the kind of uh, campaigning work that we're doing around the country with a couple of examples. We get a lot of contact from people <clears throat> who, uh, for various reasons, are concerned about uh, threats to their local hedgerows or damage and so forth. Um, a current campaign is in Kildare Town, where uh, a local hedgerow is threatened by a residential development, a quite unnecessary proposed removal of the hedge on the right-hand side of that, uh, that uh, small road. And local man, uh, Paul Ford, is doing great work to try to change the plan and leave the hedge. Uh, this is me along, and, and believe it or not, this is not in the heart of the countryside, but this is in the heart of Cabra on the north side of Dublin. This is the bank of the Royal Canal, where a, a much needed expansion of the Greenway um, is being planned. But at the moment, and this is phase, phase four of the Greenway, the current plans are extremely heavy handed, involve filling in part of the canal and, and removing the hedgerow on the left. And, uh, I led a walk a few weeks ago with a group of local people uh, looking at the issue. And this is ahead of a public consultation um, exercise where it is expected that there will be many submissions requesting a much less heavy handed and over engineered uh, design for the Greenway expansion. A couple of uh, discussion points that may be relevant at the end of this talk. We very much favor the carrot versus the stick in all this. We think that payments, better education, and uh, are, are far more important and effective than uh, regulations. And as I mentioned earlier, the, and I think you touched on it, John, in your introduction, it is a small minority of often very large industrial style uh, farming uh, outfits that <clears throat> are doing a lot of the damage. Most farmers are appalled by what they see going on. And uh, so the, the regulations really are more to address uh, a very, very small minority of people who are uh, causing a disproportionate amount of damage. And we are very strongly networking with farming organizations and building links <clears throat> and our it's anxious to avoid the phony war between environmentalists and farming groups that is at the moment unfortunately um, an, an issue in the country um, that there, there is no need for uh, you know there is so much common ground between what we're doing and other environmental groups are doing and what farming uh, groups and individuals are doing local authorities um are in our sites as well. Uh, a lot of the, the, the removal of hedgerows is on the watch of local authorities. So we really are honing in there. As I said, education and money um, are so important in all this. So I'm going to stop talking and see if there are questions. And 
open things up to discussion. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Um, I'm just wondering: is is uh, can can everybody actually? Uh, are we, can can people hear me? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Oh yeah, sorry, just having a, sl a slight technical issue here. Um, yeah, just uh, Alan, thanks very much for that. It was a very um, a comprehensive uh, piece. And um, uh, there's a question to chat, but uh, Alistair, you you just wanted to ask a question there, so far far away. Yeah, just wondering, I re I've managed to get to in Galway County Council a set of uh, guidelines for county council contractors on how they are to maintain and trim hedges. Have you seen any similar work elsewhere? Well, it's an interesting question, Alistair, because up until some years ago, uh, there the were certification courses being run in some of the agricultural <laughs> colleges um, mm -hmm. under the auspices of Chagask and uh, an expert called Neil Folks. And, you know, that there were, uh, you know, good standards and, and uh, training were available. Um, that has fallen by the wayside. And in terms of guidelines, uh, there, there is, I think it's fair to say, no agreed consensus on what good hedgerow management consists of. And this is very much the focus of the work that uh, Chogask is now uh, embarked on. And there's going to be a hedgerow forum later this year or early in the new year when all the relevant stakeholders are going to get around the table to try to hammer out, um, you know, a... a a set of guidelines that are not too complicated, but at the same time are not too simplistic. Because I suppose one of the problems is that one size doesn't fit all. And we've sort of already begun to discover that it, it's very easy to get bogged down in detail um, and, and, and sort of lose the message. And hedgerow, hedgerows are all different and different situations demand different approaches. So, you know, for example, we, we what we are trying to stress is that annual severe cutting um, is is to be avoided if possible. Clearly, along roads that, and and where road safety is an issue, that may be inevitable uh, in, in certain stretches and in narrow cases. But in other areas, what we're trying to encourage is um, raising the height of the hedge cutting a few centimeters each year. Uh, so that cutting at the same height is bad for a hedge. It, it causes disease and, and it, it's just practice. Cutting an A-shape to allow light in. Um, we are also encouraging in internal hedgerows to consider a, a rotation of hedge cutting, for example, every second year, every third, fourth, or even five years. Now, every, cutting every five years does lead to problems with many hedges and you know there's there's a problem of needing a circular saw versus a flail but in any event we are trying to encourage a less than annual cutting on internal hedges yeah we're, we're very keen to uh, to stress that mature hedges that have allowed to been allowed to grow tall should not be uh, topped side cutting there would be the treatment of choice so for electric fences and stock proofing uh, Obviously, side cutting or breasting is called is needed, but you know not to to cut uh, you know hedges that have been allowed to grow, uh, and and they're obviously great sources of of fruit and berries and nuts and so forth, as well as carbon sequestration and so on. So that's a long answer to your question, Alistair. There, there hopefully will be more um, you, you know concerted guidelines um, soon. But tell me about your situation with Galway. I, I, have you had a, an issue with Galway County Council? Okay, uh, long saga. We start with, so I, I've been on a council since 2019. And basically hedgerow cutting is, is a perennial issue. Every September, basically, can we cut more hedges? Traditionally, Galway councillors have put money in for hedge cutting in many places. Uh, to, because it's not a 
not a funded activity of the council per se, but we have discretionary money about 10,000. We'd often put three or 4,000 in to get hedge cutting in various neighborhoods. Um, but we, I got uh, a, as chair of the SPC, I got, the, uh, got a set of guidelines drawn up for how it should be done correctly. And, you know, it was an ecologist, we used an ecologist who pulled a lot of the data from our, from, from Chagas, et cetera. So they'll be very aligned with that work. But uh, with the lack of money, we are now doing less hedge cutting, um, but, uh, but emphasizing to the farmers that it is their responsibility to do it. Yeah. Uh, and to be blunt, uh, we, we had been making progress because all of the contractors for the council had known what to do carefully. Yeah. But the farmers are just going in and flailing and being extremely brutal about it. Yeah. Uh, so we need to work. Uh, we have a piece of work to finish off there. Um, but are you sorry, Alistair, Are you referring to roadside cutting in, in, in particular? Roadside cutting in particular, yes. Not internal. Not so much internal. Yeah. Uh, we do have issues. We have question marks and issues. Basically, when we cut, when the councils cut the roadsides. Uh, and it's mostly the farmer's responsibility, but the councils basically do it at, junk, for example, junctions that, that might be particularly dangerous. Um, there's potential legal issues as to why didn't, well, from another farmer, why didn't you cut my hedge? Yeah, yeah. You're cutting somebody else's. Yeah. Um, so, we, but we need to develop a, um, a code of practice that we implement across the place. Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. I mean that that's that's really interesting, and and it chimes with. Uh, we're involved with working with the climate bar in Dublin to draft a new hedgerows act, and one yeah. element of it, yeah, is to revisit the the roads act section seventy that uh, that that governs road safety, uh, mm -hmm. because at the moment what's happening, uh, and it's probably the same with with you and Galway, that landowners receive um, quite in intimidatory as I referred to earlier that put the onus back on the landowner to remove vegetation or trees or shrubs that may cause an issue with road safety but the the, the letters give no indication of what the particular problem is and they leave the landowner feeling very threatened and uh, liable to overreact and so we I think what you're referring to is so important that there needs to be a set of agreed guidelines uh, and that people do not feel so much under pressure to to do the wrong thing. That in cooperation with what you also refer to, which is uh, you know training for uh, hedge cutting contractors. Uh, many of them are are really really good, and you know we've had contact with the the Irish Contractors Association, and you know they uh, you know they get a lot of complaints about people who are not members of their organisation. Who are clearly not well trained so they're very keen for certification to be reintroduced and standards improved thank you that's great thanks thanks for that alistair there's just um alan I, if i'll just read you there's a there's a question on the chat and there's a comment so i'll just i'll just come to those and if anybody else we've got about 10 minutes or so for questions as uh, a very kind uh, message there from uh, alicia whom i know very well um very interesting. Thanks very much, for, uh, for uh, Alan, for the for the for the talk. And there's a question here from um, Caroline Hurley uh, regarding the new forestry strategy. Or does, uh, Alan, do you think that offers um, anything about hedgerows? Or is there any any reason for hope or optimism there? Or um, what have you anything to say on the, the the new forest strategy in that regard? I'm not really qualified to comment uh, on. Caroline, but I think that the issue of forestry is important to our group insofar as uh, new plantations do have a, a negative effect on pre-existing hedgerows. Uh, and one of the things that we brought to the attention of the Dáil Agricultural Committee who invited there last year was that setback from um, existing hedgerows should be far greater. Many of the hedgerows that are being lost in this country are being lost as a result of conifer plantations and, uh, and, and a proper setback, the recommended distance is seven meters uh, or a, you know, a 
paper by uh, a woman called Susan Ironmonger, I think, recommended this uh, setback. That's not being practiced at the moment. And as a result, um, many hedgerows and a significant uh, amount of hedgerows are, are being suffocated by new plantations. But I, I'm not qualified to talk about how the new forestry is, uh, uh, you, you know, recommendations are, are going to impact on, uh, on this situation other than that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alan. I suppose you, you've kind of hit on a small bit of a bugbear of mine of the proper definition of what forestry is and what it isn't. Um, yeah. Plantation is plantation. Forestry is a whole different ballgame, but it's, it's amazing how it's been, how um, Sitka Spruce monocrop plantation is, is referred to as, as a forest. I mean, uh, don't, get, yeah. don't get me going on that because you'll be here all night. Um, uh, well, I'll be here on my own talking about it all night. I'm just wondering, is there, is there anybody else who'd like to ask a question or maybe make a comment? Now is your time. Okay, Alan, I was just going to, um, if anybody wants to jump in at any stage, um, I was just going to ask one or two. Um, I suppose if there was kind of, uh, and I, I know there's no silver bullets uh, to this, um, Alan, but if there was one measure you felt could, I mean, I know you've referred there to a new Hedro Act. If there was one measure, um, and we talk about, and you, you referred to Don, uh, uh, Donald Sheehan, and I've visited his farm a number of times, I know Don, um, uh, and it's worth seeing his hedgerows for, for what they are, um, and he also has barren owl boxes and all this up there, it's, very, it's a very interesting place to visit. Um, I'm just wondering, and when we're talking about ecosystem services and paying farmers uh, correctly, I, I believe it, there should be, uh, you know, positivity should be recorded, rewarded. If there was one sort of silver bullet, one big measure you, you could implement tomorrow, what, what would that be? If that's not a, an awful question. Yeah. Well, I don't think that there's a simple, simple answer, but I think that it would come under the heading of remuneration um, and, and funding, because I think that uh, the, the failure of the most recent cap to recognize the benefit of existing hedgerows is a problem. And it uh, and it has led, you know, to a, you know part part of the, the the issue that we really focus in on is the management of existing hedgerows, and the focus on new planting is great. But we have this fantastic resource in the shape of, you know, over six hundred thousand kilometers of hedgerows, which are in poor condition. And if there was uh, a way of uh, and, and we, in our proposal to the new cap, we, we put in um, a, a sort of template for how existing hedgerows could be rewarded with a simple uh, grading system uh, with the top payment going to the best quality hedgerows. Um, and, you know, that, that was considered too complex and impractical to implement by uh, the department. But I think funding is, is the key alongside education. So the silver bullet is probably under those twin headings. Um, I, I think that you know, you know better knowledge is really important because the the fashion for cutting hedges to a very low height annually really it, 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 you know there there is no logical reason for it. it. It's expensive to get in contractors annually, and you know if that could be changed by I think better. Uh, examples in in our, our area we're trying to find ambassador and we found a number of ambassador farmers a bit like Donald Sheehan in the in the bride you know we're identifying uh, local farmers who are doing things differently <clears throat> and organizing events to to demonstrate how taller wider hedges can look really good and you know they don't have to look messy they don't have to look untidy so money and education and are are, are the the, the the twin silver bullets, I think. Thank, thanks, Alan. And just back to Car Carolyn's put a very useful resource there, uh, Alan, as well, and for everybody else to note. Um, so Car Carolyn's just thanking thanking you for your uh, response there, but also putting in. Um, it looks like what's a, a pretty good uh, resource there, so you can cut anyone to have a look at that there, maybe cut and paste it. Um, and I think uh, what what Carolyn is referring there to is the um, increased, I suppose, uh, and again, I'm no expert on this, on the policy side of things, increased, increased emphasis on uh, native, native planting. 
um, which which I think we'd, we'd all welcome. Um, we've probably got time for one more uh, question or comment. If if anybody has um, a burning question, now is now is your time. Um, Just to um, remind people that the Hedgelink UK uh, website is a fantastic resource uh, with, with lots of information and videos and so on. We're actually linked uh, as a group to Hedgelink UK and uh, uh, it's a resource as is Chagask and, and I can't emphasize enough the, the wonderful work that the National Biodiversity Centre is doing at the moment. Yeah. And just to draw people's attention as well, Car Caroline, uh, who's, who's playing a blinder tonight by way of information here, uh, has just put up a, a link there to the Chagas website as well. So um, Chagas is um, organizing live information events around the country on new forestry screens to start soon. So that's that's a good that's a good resource to have as well. Um, uh, so John, um, John, can, yeah, sorry. Can I'll, I just can I just Let's end on the comment, though, perhaps, because I, I made reference to uh, land acquisition as a, you know, it's a big talking point, and Ella McSweeney discussed this on her Countrywide programme last Saturday. Um, we got, uh, we, we were interested to note an, an, an article by Michael McDowell a year ago referring to Article 45 of the Constitution, which recommends that land uh, should be distributed in a way that allows the economic sustainability of individual farmers. And there really is a, a, a big phenomenon at play at the moment in the country with um, enormous amounts of land being acquired by um, syndicates or individuals. Uh, I mean, this came to the fore, you may remember, with the, the anti-Gresham um, demonstration uh, about Quilcher selling land, uh, forestry. Mm. But I think there is a debate to be had, and it might well be an election issue about the... Um, about the whole question of uh, the buying up of enormous amounts of land by a small number of typically syndicates or multimillionaires. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, listen, Alan, I'm really glad. I'm really. I think this is the start of a conversation because I know at before we opened up to the floor as well, we were talking about things like. Um, uh, mental health, the mental health benefits of green spaces. Uh, there's so much. I mean, when I when when you showed the photographs, I could feel my own mood sort of lift when I saw the the, the yellow hammer, the the hedgehog, which I have a particular affinity, and just those lovely pictures of the hedgerow. And I think um, we can talk about the finances, the science of it, but also just the pure aesthetics of a hedgerow in spring or any time in the autumn as well. Particularly, is just beautiful. So what I'd say to people is. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And I think this is the beginning of a, a conversation. I, I have no doubt we, uh, we'll, we'll be talking more and soon, hopefully. Um, and thanks for, to, to people for attending. And um, uh, this meeting obviously was recorded. So we'll be putting this up on our, on our uh, Just Transition Green um, you, YouTube. Uh, so listen, Alan, thanks very much. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, there's a lot to go, but I, I, I come out, I'm coming, coming out of the meeting with, obviously, I'm well aware of the challenges, but I feel just a little bit more positive now. And I think that's, that's, um, that's important too, because we do, you know, those of us have been in the environmental area for many, many years can be get, get weary and disillusioned. Yeah. Um, and I, I just feel a little bit more positive, not, not, in a, not in a sort of a toxic positivity kind of way. But in a real way, I think there's a. I think we are turning a corner, and many farmers that I know, is small farmers in West Waterford that I would have known when I was growing up, uh, and these were these were old uh, farmers, and they had a great affection for nature and the environment and hedgerows. And one farmer I know in particular, his his biggest fear uh, when he when he passes on, uh, you know, when he dies, is someone. Uh, in, in particular, gentlemen, not not acquiring his farm, and he knows what he'd do with the farm, and that's a real, real, a real emotional fear for him. And I think yeah. that's sad for him, but I think it just shows there. Are, I think there are actually lots of farmers who feel that way. And this artificial war between environmentalists and farmers, I think you you address that in payments. I, I think that serves certain people and certain politicians to drive a wedge between the greens and farmers. And I myself come from a farming background, well, a rural background, and it's a completely artificial divide, up to a point. We could probably communicate better sometimes. I'm, yeah. I'm not saying 
it's all it's you know but i think it serves an agenda but um listen i think we'll leave it at that alan once again Thank thanks you. so much uh, i'll be in touch but yes thanks so much for your time i know you're a busy man but it was an yeah. excellent presentation i really enjoyed it yeah. and thanks everybody for for attending and thanks particularly to caroline for providing us all with a brilliant information so i'll be cutting and pasting there and uh, thanks for louis for for hosting and doing the tech support tonight that's uh, invaluable because uh, i i'd be stressed out of my mind if i had to think and do that at the same time <laughs> So thanks everybody, really appreciate it. So thanks. we'll see you soon and uh, we'll probably have another event very, very soon. Thank so you. thanks, thanks everybody, enjoy your evening. Bye. Very much, bye-bye. Thanks.